presents an inspiring gospel reflection by Father Michael Sparrow. Father Michael is a Jesuit priest working as a writer and retreat master at the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House outside Chicago. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. As Jesus continued his journey to Jerusalem, he traveled through Samaria and Galilee. As he was entering a village, 10 lepers met him. They stood at a distance from him and raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. And one of them, realizing that he had been healed, returned, glorifying God in a loud voice. And he fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said in reply, Ten were cleansed, were they not? Where are the other nine? Has none but this foreigner returned to give thanks to God? Then he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has saved you. The Gospel of the Lord. I suspect today's Gospel is familiar to many of us. It's a story of thanksgiving. Lepers, just to remind you, were outcasts within the ancient society of Jesus' time. There was no known cure for the disease, and there was great fear, just as we experience fear in the midst of unknown diseases, in the midst of a pandemic, and how is it, how is it transmitted? So the lepers had to be kept at a distance. And there were all kinds of rules and laws that would prescribe how a leper was to interact with the community. Basically, they were to be kept apart. And if they were coming upon other people, they would have to call up, call out in a loud voice and say, unclean, unclean, so that everybody in the area would know that they are uh, sick and to keep, to use today's term, a proper social distance. But here, instead of simply calling out unclean, unclean, the lepers recognize that it's Jesus, and they call out to him, Jesus, have pity on us. In other words, they have faith in the healing power of Jesus, and then they call out as a group, Jesus, have pity on us. Now, in th Jesus heals several different, there are several different accounts of Jesus healing lepers, in the scriptures, and sometimes he reaches out and touches them, violates the social norm of the time, because no one was supposed to touch a leper for fear that you would catch the contagion. Here, Jesus calls out to them at a distance, doesn't touch them, but sends them on their way to go tell the priest, because that was what, what, that's what was prescribed in the law, that priest would be the one who would judge whether someone was cleansed or not and whether they could enter back into the community in normal interactions. The priest would be, in that sense, like the doctor of saying, you're healed, you can interact in a normal way. But notice, when Jesus sends them to the priest, they're not healed at that point. They call out and they say, Jesus, heal us, have, have mercy on us. And Jesus says, well, go to the priests. 
And all ten of them have enough faith, and they're going as a group, saying, well, something good is going to happen. And it wasn't immediately. There were some... This is what I love about Jesus' healing stories. They're, each one of them has a different nuance. Some take place instantaneously, but not so with this one. Jesus says, go to the priests, and on their way to the priests, they're healed. In other words, they have to have enough faith to trust that what Jesus says to them is going to be fulfilled. And all ten of them have that faith, and they're on their way to the priests. But here's the twist in the story. When they recognize that they're healed, nine of them simply do what Jesus has told them to do, which is go to the priest. But one of them returns to say thanks. Jesus didn't say, and come on back and say thanks. Or he didn't say, turn around when you recognize that you've been healed and come back and acknowledge that. Jesus didn't give them that rule. There was only one who figured out that that was the unwritten hope in Jesus' heart, that they would return to say thanks. And of course, the added detail in the story is, who is this guy who remembers to come back and who figures it out who, to come back and say thanks? He's a Samaritan. Jesus names him as a foreigner. Another name would be a heretic. Another name would be some strange outcast. There was this tension between the pious Jews and the Samaritans because the Samaritans were those Jews who had intermingled with the local population and had watered down the Jewish faith. So they, they in that sense, the Jews would look down their nose as these were people who were not following the true faith. And yet that's the guy, <laughs> that's the guy who comes back. Jesus lifts up a Samaritan in the parable of the Good Samaritan as well as somebody who's outside the, the normal religious tradition and yet comes back and does the right thing. Comes back and says thanks. What are we to take from this story? Well, certainly, Jesus says, stand up and go your way. Your faith has saved you. So we want to have faith that Jesus wants only what is best for us in all the circumstances of our life. Jesus wants what's best for us. Have faith in that. And it's the faith of those men following Jesus' prescription that allows them to be healed. Lesson number one. But perhaps even the more important lesson is one of thanksgiving. Jesus doesn't say, come back and give thanks. We have to figure that out on our own. We know from psychological studies, if you have any association with the 12-step program, if you do the Ignatian examine, if you read the, the scriptures carefully, you know that to give thanks and praise to God adds nothing to God's greatness, but it helps us grow in holiness. It's a right ordering. When we remember the blessings that God has done, it adds nothing to God. God doesn't need our praise. God doesn't need our thanks. It's not like God is saying, praise me, praise me, thank me, thank me. Oh, you didn't thank me. Okay you know, away with you. It adds nothing to God. But when we say thanks, it puts our problems in perspective and we remember the great blessings that God has given. I was listening to a homily recently and the priest wisely said, compare and despair. In fact, I've used that phrase often in spiritual direction and some of the homilies that I've given. But in this instance, I would say, the opposite of a great truth is another great truth. Sometimes we need to compare our situation. Oftentimes when we're comparing, we look up and we see somebody who seems to have it so much better than we, and then we compare and we despair. 
In this instance, I would say, look around you at people who are suffering and who don't have nearly what we have. And let your heart be filled with gratitude. One of my Jesuit brothers that I interact with periodically is over in Lebanon right now studying Arabic. He wants to become a scholar between Islamic and Christian religions. I don't know if you've read in the news right now, but Lebanon is imploding. Its economy is in the tank. Its government is failing. And the people are experiencing extreme, extreme poverty and deprivation right now. The price of petrol and electricity is off, off the charts. Wages have plummeted. He's living in the midst of that situation. Sometimes the chaos is so great in the cities that he can't go out to, to go to school, to go, to go to the classes for danger of his life. Or have you read about what's going on in Afghanistan right now? That there's the danger of mass starvation in the midst of that, uh, the midst of that country right now. Or the homilies that you've heard from Father Strzok, who spent 32 years over in Africa right now. And so much of Africa is in danger of famine because of the extreme drought that's going on in this country and in those countries. Look around us at the, the blessings that we have. And so often we just get caught up in the ordinary problems of life and we want to say, well, what, what, do I have, what, what do I have to give thanks for? You know, I got a tough life right now. I got so, much, so many pressures at work. My spouse is complaining. My kids are complaining. I don't have anything to be, be thankful for. I don't know about you, but day after day, I, <clears throat> I hear about people who are sick, seriously sick, who are asking for prayers. Do you know people who are sick in, in your life? You, we're healthy enough right, right today that we can gather together and we can give praise. We're able to go to church. I can think of half a dozen people right now that would give anything to be able to be here in church right now, but they're too sick to be able to, to, to come. And we don't have anything to be thankful for. What St. Paul says, in all circumstances, give thanks to God. This is the will of Christ Jesus. Please don't misunderstand me. The point of this sermon is not to make you feel guilty. The point of the sermon is to open our eyes to the blessings that are given. The great saints are those that recognize that in every set of circumstances, God is in fact blessing us. I was talking to a young man who was 18 years old who underwent a, underwent a serious surgery yesterday. I was praying for him the day, they be, praying with him the day before the surgery and just reminding him of how many people were praying with him and for him. And his mother and his grandmother are so grateful that so many people are interceding on his behalf. One of my go-to stories is in the Acts of the Apostles, where the apostles are whipped and beaten and thrown in chains in the midst of prison, and they give thanks to God for having been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. That just absolutely astounds me. They're whipped, they're beaten, they're thrown in chains, they're in prison, and they're giving thanks to God that they could offer up their sufferings to the Lord. In all circumstances, God is blessing us, calling us to that inner peace that the Lord wants us to have. Closing image. One of the books that has changed my life profoundly is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. 
He was a Viennese psychologist, psychiatrist, who was thrown, because he was a Jew, he was thrown into the Auschwitz concentration camp. And he noticed that some people in those concentration camps, whether they were physically strong or well-educated or pious, would wither up and die. And other people who were seemingly frail would, would survive. He couldn't figure it out until he put this together, and it's the point of his book, that when we have meaning in our lives, it taps into an inner resource, changes our attitude, improves our health, and gives us a certain peace, even in the midst of the most difficult set of circumstances. This is what our faith, this is what our Catholic faith can do for us. It's to say that the Lord is loving us and blessing us and even the most difficult of circumstances in our lives were not to give up because God never abandons us. The promise that Jesus has given is that he will be Emmanuel, God with us in all the circumstances of our life. So every day, take some time to give thanks, to remember the blessings not for God's sake, he doesn't need it, for our sake. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand. Spirit of Jesus, open our hearts to live and to love the gospel.